Good morning, First Baptist Church, Redlands. My name is Reverend Robert Wilkins, and I'm pleased to be with you this morning. I'd like to thank my good friend, Pastor Sean Zambrose, for the invitation to be with you during the Advent season. Please pray with me. Loving and almighty God, we thank you for yet another opportunity to gather together as your people to hear words of ancient script that we hope to enlighten our minds, encourage our hearts, and empower our spirits to be your people in a world that desperately needs your presence. Be with us, O oh God, throughout this service as we sing songs of Zion, as we pray prayers, as we offer gifts to the uplifting of the kingdom for the sake of Jesus, our Christ, whom we celebrate today throughout this season and always. It is in his name that we pray and give thanks. Amen. Our text for the morning is Psalm 85, verses 8 through 13. They have been read for our hearing already. I'd like to reflect on those verses this morning under the heading, Peace Prepares the Way. Peace Prepares the Way. Some of us this morning have faced dire financial circumstances where we need significant help. We need a bailout or a relief package of sorts. This is not our first time in this situation. And some of those times have been brought about by circumstances beyond our control. Some of them have been brought about by perhaps not the wisest um, and well-planned decisions on our part. And sometimes it's a situation where there simply are not enough resources for the needs that we must meet to maintain our lives and that of our families. As we face these dilemmas, we sometimes pace the floor, wring our hands and search our minds for solutions and also try to envision who among our friends, family and associates might be able to help us out of the situation that we find ourselves. We may start out with a long roster of eligible people that we think, but quite quickly that list gets much smaller. And first of all, there are, there's, there are those on the list who we asked before and things just didn't go well. With a lot of energy and enthusiasm, they said very quickly, no, simply not going to do it. And so we eliminate them. We continue to search uh, our minds and search that list, and we come across some others that we have asked before, or we know their particular personalities uh, very well, and we know that they either have or will have lots of questions for us, like, what were you thinking when you went on vacation? Where did you think you would get the money that you needed for all of the other things that you have to pay for. Did you have to take that vacation or buy those uh, shoes or whatever expenditures that uh, you made? So you've got the questioners and you eliminate them and the list becomes smaller yet. Then there are those who have financial advice suddenly they have become Warren Buffett or Susie Orman, and they have advice to offer. They say to you, well, what you might wanna think about is that they have some apps now, some uh, electronic apps that can help you when you deposit your paycheck, it will automatically embargo 50% of your paycheck, and it can only be used to pay necessities, rent, car note, food, things for uh, sickness and illness, and possibly something for children. And then whatever you have left, 
you are able to spend that on a scheduled uh, basis, $50 a week, $100 a week or whatever. They have those kinds of apps available and that way you could avoid this kind of situation. You say, oh, that is uh, a really good idea. Thank you so uh, much for that. And you kindly take their advice and eliminate them yet from the list. So now we're down to the final few. That list has gone from a pretty healthy list now to a very small list. And even among those, there are a few that you have some question about because you have never asked them for anything before and you are not certain if the nature of your relationship from their perspective is one that allows you to ask for financial help. And so you hesitate about asking them because you certainly do not need any disappointment nor any more advice or a lot more questions at this particular point. And so that list becomes even that much smaller. But on the, of the remaining few, there is one among them that you know will help you. You know that because they have helped you before several times to be exact. And you know because they are just those kinds of people. They are genuinely kind. They are genuinely generous and helpful. And most of all, they are non-judgmental and don't often have a lot of advice uh, to give since that's what not what you're asking for in the moment. They always want what is good for you and they want to see you do well. Now they hold high expectations of you and will hold you accountable, but they will surely help you. So despite the fact that you put yourself in this financial distress hole again, you approach the one person that you know will respond positively. Is there anyone listening this morning who knows what I'm talking about, have been in that situation before? Well, if you do, then you will clearly understand the context in which this particular psalm was written. This psalm, the, the psalm, the verses that were chosen for the lectionary this morning are actually verses one and two, and then verses eight through 13, omitting verses three through seven. But any attempt and accurately interpreting and applying verses eight through 13 require us to set the stage by looking briefly at verses one through seven. This Psalm is a communal prayer for help in the midst of a crisis. It is divided into three sections. Section one, verses one through three, is about the past. All of the verbs are in the past tense. It says God showed favor to Israel. God restored her fortunes. God forgave Israel her sins. They speak of God's previous rescue and restorative activity in the community of Israel. In the second section, verses four through seven, the psalmist is concerned about the present. They are in a crisis. The verbs are no longer in the past tense. The people cry out and plead for God to restore them again in the present situation. Clearly, this current crisis stems from the collective sin of the community because they ask God in verse five, will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Indeed, they have some history with this God. They hold fond memories of the time when God turned from wrath and forgiveness and performed saving acts for their benefit. They're asking now, they're pleading now, will you not revive us again? 
and they plead and beg God, show us your unfailing love, O God, and grant us your salvation. The third and final section of this psalm, verses 8 through 13, bring, introduces a new voice, perhaps the voice of a prophet or of worship leader who rises to deliver a word of hope and peace from God to God's faithful. The mood of the language becomes optimistic, and the verb tense changes toward the future. I will listen to what the Lord will say. The Lord promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear or revere him, that his glory may dwell in the land. Now there are varied opinions as to what exactly they are referring to, the timing and the writer of this psalm. A few commentators suggest it is before the time of exile in Babylon. Slightly fewer associated with the time during the exile in Babylon. But many more scholars believe that it was written just after Israel returned from captivity in Babylon. Israel, you see, had been sent to Babylon for 70 years as punishment for their sins against the Lord. Now they have been restored to their own land, but their hearts and their behavior are still not where they need to be. Now the truth of the matter is that we do not precisely know the timing, the authorship, or the actual background for this psalm. What we do know for certain is that Israel, the nation, has experienced restoration before, but it still stands in great need of revival now. And in that way, this text, for whatever context it came out of, is relevant across the ages. Israel's situation parallels ours in the United States today to a remarkable degree. We have been saved by the grace of God many times and delivered from the penalty of our sins and waywardness. In this century alone, think about the 9-11 attacks in 2001. They were caused in part by anti-American Islamic extremism because of US support for Israel and support for repressive and secular Arab regimes. But there is also questionable foreign policy and military maneuvers practiced by the US throughout the Middle East and the world. We suffered for a while from the attacks, but with God's help, we were revived. Remember also the 2007 financial crisis triggered by the breakdown of trust among banks the year before the 2008 financial collapse, which was caused by the subprime mortgage scandal, which itself was produced by the unregulated use of financial derivatives supported by an economic system that promotes and rewards self-interest, growth at all costs, and greed. With God's help, we recovered from each of these horrific crises. We have been repeatedly blessed beyond words, but we are still not where we need to be with God, with our neighbors, next door and around the world and with the earth, as evidenced by the multi-pandemic environment in which we now live. The coronavirus, with its accompanying economic crises, the extreme polarization among citizens, racial reckoning, and the earth lashing back with wildfires, 
extreme storms, flooding, record cold and hot temperatures across the nation show us that after years of misuse and neglect at our hands, the earth has had enough. Just like ancient Israel, individually and as a nation, we stand in need of revival. Now this is the second Sunday of Advent, when we light the candle of peace. The Advent season invites us to step away from what is most often a frenzied time of shopping and buying, eating and drinking too much, to consider how we commemorate the birth of Jesus. O come, O come, Emmanuel, we sing, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Rejoice, Israel, for Emmanuel will come to thee. While Israel would have sung the song in expectation of Jesus' first coming, the faithful today now sing the songs, yes, in commemoration of that first coming, but also in expectation and deep longing of the second coming of Christ in the future. Many wish for that future to be soon, even now. Theologically, this is what we call already but not yet theology. We already have received the gift of the Son of God into the world ages ago in a manger in Bethlehem. We already are active members of the kingdom of God, and we enjoy the Holy Spirit benefits of the living, dying, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. But at the same time, we do not yet see or experience the kingdom in all of its fullness and glory, where there is no more sickness or death, no more poverty, no more war, no more lying, no more polarization, racism, sexism, exclusion of foreigners. No need for the sun, for God is the light. But not yet. Therefore, Advent is actually a complicated concept and season to properly observe. It is a time of patient waiting and a time of eager anticipation and of confident hope because God has promised. How can you suitably honor both of these? On the one hand, as Christians, we often get confused early in the season, thinking we have a holy obligation to be somber and silent and to keep all of our hope and joy on hold, wrapped carefully with nice bow, paper and bows and tucked away until late December. On the other hand, the secular world beckons us to celebrate joyfully every day from Halloween to New Year's Day by shopping, gathering, dancing, laughing, and being merry. Advent is even more complicated in this year 2020 that has been such a very hard and challenging period, filled with conflict, strife, chaos, and stress. Our souls are weary. We're close to a breakdown. We're suffering fatigue on many fronts. We suffer COVID fatigue, isolation and shelter in place fatigue, unemployment fatigue, Zoom meeting fatigue, social distance fatigue, political divisiveness and civil protest fatigue. 
We are looking to catch a break and catch it now. So yes, O come, O come, Emmanuel. But as we wait to celebrate Emmanuel at Christmas, in the meantime, what shall we do? The words of the psalmist offer strong advice when he says, God promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear or revere him so that his glory may dwell in the land. In other words, in the meantime, as we wait for the celebration of the Christ child at Christmas, Hold on and think of the promise. Think of and remember the times that God has brought you through, even when it was dark, even when it looked hopeless. Do not return to folly. Do not return to the midnight sales. Do not return to the office parties that go till four o'clock uh, in the morning. Hold on to God's promises and God's unchanging hand. Right in the very heart of this psalm, there is a plea for God to send his people a revival. The word revival means to refresh, to restore, to live prosperously. Revival supposes that there has been life in the past, but now there is a need for a refreshing, a restoring of that life. When life is refreshed and restored, those who are revived will live on a higher, more prosperous level. Oh, how we need revival. I need revival. You and you need revival. Our leaders need revival. Everyone within the sound of my voice this morning needs revival. Some things we need refreshed, and some things we need restored, and other things we need renewed altogether. The psalm gives us a little insight into what real revival involves. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Here the psalmist is describing what the kingdom will look like when the Lord dwells in the land. Peace prepares the way for God's movement in the world, God's dwelling in the land. The Hebrew word we translate as peace is shalom. The way shalom is used does not mean simply to feel calm, nor does it mean simply the absence of conflict. Instead, shalom peace is the result of right relationships with God, with one another, and with creation. The concept of peace is wholeness in all of life. It includes and encompasses faithfulness, righteousness, love, and peace in the partial sense. Shalom is the very heart and desire of God for God's world and God's people. Now and always, God dwells in the land. God moves in and among us through God's people, us. If God is to be known, it is because God's people show that God is alive through our behavior, through our work, through our worship, and through our witness in the world, we make God alive. As Walter Brueggemann, the great biblical scholar says, 
We baptized people are the ones who have signed on for the Jesus story of peace and abundance, wholeness in other words. We are the ones who have decided that this story is true. We have become and must become the people and the place where faithfulness, righteousness, love, and peace, wholeness in all of life for all people, we are the ones who show that that is alive and on display, practiced in abundance, both in the church and in the community. When we embody the attributes of God in our daily lives, once again, faithfulness, righteousness, love, generosity, kindness, forgiveness, then we manifest the presence of God. And what we do will bring about shalom and prepare the way for the steps of God in the world. Yes, we too suffer the slings and arrows, pains and sorrows of life in a broken world. But God has brought us through more than once. So Advent really is not a conflicting time for us. Advent is really our good time. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, our sainted brother who faced down the Nazi government with his own faithfulness even unto death, had this to say about Advent. The celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater. That is us, all of us, sinners saved by grace, still imperfect even within our salvation, who are looking for a greater and brighter day and who have been endowed and empowered to help that brighter day happen. It is us, it is Advent season, it is our time to shine and to light the candle of peace, light the candle of hope, light the candle of joy, light the candle of love with our actions. So this Advent season, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me and each one of us. The prayer of St. Francis of Assisi is particularly fitting for this moment. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive and it's in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. And so this Advent season, let each one of us prepare God's way by practicing faithfulness, righteousness, peace, and let that peace begin with us. May each of you have a blessed Advent, and may your households be blessed by God. Amen. Let it be so.